You see, that's what I get for hitting mute. It was such a good opening, too. It was such a good opening. We're going to just kill the whole stream. I'm going to start it over. No, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> and you're going to learn something today. <laughs> I'm Joshua Bardwell, uh, and I'm going to be taking your questions. Yeah, no, catch up, catch up, guys, catch up. There, no, you'll catch up. There it is. Yeah, there's some lag. You guys are gonna. There's gonna be a little bit of lag on the chat today because I tried using one of the low latency options in my last stream, and some of you had some video issues. So I'm on the the normal latency, but it does mean there's a little bit of lag on the chat. But we'll we'll get through it all. We'll get through it all. So I'm gonna be taking your questions uh, in the chat and also in the super chat. Yep. If you don't know what that is, super chat means uh, down in the chat window. When you, uh, when you type your question next to the little emoji icon, there is also a little dollar sign or whatever currency your local currency is. And what that means is you can you know, attach a tip of a couple bucks uh, to it and uh, it pulls it out in a whole separate window to make sure that it, stands, it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. But I'm going to be answering questions from everybody. I have always felt uh, I don't want to turn it into a, into a dollars game. I want to help everybody regardless of whether they throw me a tip or not. And I have, I have faith in the goodness of human nature that if you help everybody, whether they can pay you or not, that the ones who can will, will take care of you. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. So far, so good. I am, uh, I'm about four weeks into uh, doing this full time. And so far, I, I haven't run out of money. So it's good. <laughs> keep doing it. Um, I also have a thread up on Patreon. Uh, if you're one of my patrons, I posted a thread over there for you to put your questions as well. And I'm going to definitely make sure I get to those. Uh, Got to take care of the patrons, right? Before we get into the questions, uh, there's a thing I've been doing at the beginning of my live streams uh, where I just take a quick look at some of the products I've got sitting on my shelf that haven't quite, I just haven't found time to make a whole video about. You know, back in the day, I used to just bang out a quick video, 10 minutes here, five minutes there, you know, uh, just, hey, here's this thing. And you would go, oh, that's so cool. Thanks for showing me. And now I bang out a quick five minute video and you're like, man, you're really letting any standards slip. So I'm trying to sneak some of these things into the live stream, things that I think are cool, that I think you guys want to hear about, but that might not necessarily make it to like, a video. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you guys, ooh, what are we going to start with? Here's what we're going to start with. This, this is an LED setup from Furious FPV. And it is pretty cool. Obviously, if you know and want to wire up your LEDs, that's fine. But this little guy here is the voltage regulator. And these are little pluggable, programmable LED strips. No soldering. They just have a little plug on the end. And the other cool thing that this does is it's programmable, not through the Betaflight LED interface. I mean, I assume it is programmable that way too. I don't know. But you can actually set it up so an aux channel on your transmitter, so you like flip a switch or turn a knob on your transmitter and it changes what the LEDs are doing. And that's pretty cool because not everybody wants to program Betaflight's LED strip function. And some people are using their LED strip pad for other things like soft serial. You've remapped it. And what it does is you actually just wire your receiver straight up to this guy and it just listens to the channel <laughs> and it pulls the, so you don't even have to do any weird channel forwarding. Um, so that's all really, really cool. But here's the thing. Here's, here's the problem. Oh, I have the wrong battery. Hold on. Oh, I can do this. Here we go. Uh, green is ground, right? Yeah, green for ground. Does that make sense? And yellow for hot. Okay, get ready for smoke. No smoke. Okay, here's the problem. I'm trying to make sure I don't short this out and kill something. Here, this is the one I should be holding. That's the hot one. Okay, so pretty good. Pretty. Oh, wait a second. Well, you kind of can't see that because of the camera, but... This one is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Oh, it is now. Hold on. Oh, darn. I can see you can't see that because of the camera. That's unfortunate. Back it away. You know, this one's solid green. This one has got some blue and some red. And this one's got some, it's kind of blinking. And, and um, yeah, so, like, out of eight LED strips they sent me, two of them are basically busted. And that kind of sums up Furious FPV in a sense. 
They have so many really cool products, really innovative ideas, really exciting and interesting flight controller designs, other things that they just they just never stop making new cool stuff. And then occasionally you buy it and it's just like it's, it's the Q, QC is not quite there. So, But that's a really cool product. I was happy to see it. I'm sorry that 25% of the LED strips were no good. This, this frame, I this was given to me by a fella when I was in Stuttgart. And what is in this little Altoids tin? By the way, the name of it is Drukbar, D-R-U-C-K-B-A-E-R dot J-I-M-D-O, Jimdo dot com. Drukbar Racing Frames. And yes, in fact, in this little Altoids tin is a five-inch quadcopter frame. Really? Five-inch? I think so. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Five-inch quadcopter frame. That's it. That's the whole thing right there. How about that? That's pretty cool. Thank you so much uh, to the guy, the guy who gave, uh, gave this to me. Thank you so much. Okay. Next. Next. Now this is going to blow your mind. Do to do, do no, not that one. Oh no, that's the one. It's just got a canopy on it now. Is that so? Is that for real? Uh, that's the Rex. Yeah, look at this frame. I'm, I'm, I'm. I have this. Really, come on, go. There we go. I have this frame, and I need to build it. But I just want you guys to look at this. Is your mind being blown right now? Is your mind being blown, right? Mine is. I get a lot of offers of, hey, do you want to look at this frame? But very seldom do I see one that makes me go, yeah, I want to see that. This, what have they done with the camera? How do you think that's going to feel when you're flying? Is it going to do something weird to the steering? I have no idea, but I'm so curious to find out. And look at this. Hang on. So... This is one of the arms. It's all, it's carbon fiber, but it's like you can see uh, the fiber is bent. That's not, that's not milled out of a sheet of carbon in that shape. It's actually single strand fiber that's been bent and it fits into the base plate like this. What the F? What is even going on there? Okay, that's pretty cool. Aerodyne RC, that's pretty cool. Um, oh, this. See, all of these are frames. It's so hard for me to do a whole video about a frame anymore. I have to do like a build, and I get so behind on frames. This is the Leviathan from Newbie Drone. Look at that. Injection molded plastic. It's not 3D printed. Injection molded plastic shell. How about that? That's kind of cool. Uh, let's see. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, one more thing. One more thing, and that is this. This. Yeah, you're right. How would a GoPro go on the Aerodyne? That's a rate. It's a pure racing frame. So they just assume you're not using a GoPro. Last thing. This. What is this? This is the Sky Zone Sky O3, uh, and. People had always said to me, Joshua, you got to try out some Sky Zones. I, I, and they were right. These are really cool. These are really nice. They said, oh, there's an OS, there's a, there's an on-screen display in the goggles. And I was like, isn't that so clunky? Because the only on-screen display I had really dealt with was the one in the um, Flying Lemon, the Flying Lemon module. And it's not really a full graphical OSD. It's it's kind of a character-based OSD. It's not very, it's pretty clunky. But these are something. I might actually buy the argument. People would say, why do you want to take your goggles off to change channels? Why don't you just change channels in the goggle? And I was like, well, come on. How are you going to see the screen? But this is not bad. There's just a button here for channel and a button here for band. And there's a really nice display inside that shows you what channel and band you're on as you flip through. And it's even got a band scanner. so you can, And it shows like a graphical display of the signal strength across the band as you go through. That's pretty cool. But I don't know if you guys, do you guys know NJ Tech? NJ Tech. Uh, I, I always think it's like New Jersey, but he's actually not. He's from, I think he's from the UK. And his name, he's, 
his, his initials are NJ. He has a YouTube channel and he does, he does reviews of products that make me curse and go, damn, you're good. <laughs> and he did a review of these and he talked about how the bridge, the bridge of the nose really pushes on your nose and that temples don't seal. And the minute I got these and put these on, that is exactly the same impression I had. So I can back him up on that. When I put these on my face, my nose, it presses hard on my nose and doesn't feel comfortable. And look at the difference. I don't know if I can kind of show you this on camera. But look at the difference between the Fat Shark Attitude and, and this is true for all the Fat Sharks. I just grabbed the Attitude because that's the one I happen to have. You can see how the Attitude, let me see if I can get it. Oh, I can't get it. I don't know how to, there we go. The Attitude is much more curved. Whereas the Sky Zone is much flatter. Oh, great. Bang that around. So whenever I put the Sky Zones on, it feels like it needs a much, much thicker foam because it has let light leak in through the temples. It's not very, not very uh, comfortable. So those are some products that I have outstanding that I keep meaning to do a video about, but I never get to. And now I've showed them to you on the live stream. Um, yeah. All right, guys. Let's start with the questions then. And the... Reken Havoc 787 says, how do I donate? Reken Havoc 787, if you go down to the chat where you type the very comment that you just typed, you'll see that there's a dollar sign or a euro or whatever your local currency is. And when you go to type your chat, instead of hitting enter, you, you click that button and you can put a, give, a, give a tip. So, um, No, yeah, seal and freak. I don't have a big nose. That's not it at all. It's not the size of your nose. It's really pressing like right here on the bridge of your nose. And it's not just that, but if the goggles were more curved, then maybe they wouldn't press on your nose. But And it's a shame. I really want to like them, and I, I really want to play with the foam and see if I can get it to work because I dig. I dig them. Um, I really dig them. Uh, but the other thing to ask about them, though, is these are, I think they're, the SkyZone Sky03 is like four fifty nine, which you can now get this uh, Fat Shark HD3, Basically, it's a Fat Shark HD3, uh, like a, without a module. I don't know what they've done, but there's a cheaper HD3 you can buy, and at 4.59 or something for the Sky Zones, you're really into Fat Shark plus LaForge money, and that becomes a, if the Sky Zone is like 3.50, that's kind of compelling. But if it's 4.50, it's a little less compelling. Hey, speaking of LaForge, did you all see LaForge V4 has been announced? Brand new hardware. USB, uh, USB plug, on-screen display. Oh, so yeah, go check out the UBED webpage uh, for check out LaForge V4. Hold on. Let me grab uh, a drink. Okay. Lance Flag asks, do you think with all the drama with race flight, do you think it's going away anytime soon? Uh, no, I don't think race flight's going away anytime soon. The, 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 the drama is never going to kill race flight. What, what might have killed race flight in a different timeline is if race flight's secret sauce got all put into beta flight and then people just said, oh, screw it, I'll fly beta flight. But race flight will continue to be around as long as Kalen keeps coding. And here's the thing. Kalen submits this calm and filter to beta flight it's an open source project and it's kind of like when you're used to living by yourself and then suddenly you have a bunch of roommates, everything they do annoys you, but it's not them. It's just, you're used to living by yourself, right? Well, race flight is kind of like Kalen's little playground where he can do whatever he wants. And if no one, no one can say, Hey, don't do it that way. Or I don't like it. Or I want to change it. He submitted the, the Kalman filter to beta flight. And the first thing they did is they said, oh, that's really cool. It flies really good. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty hard on the CPU. What if we did this other thing that was functionally the same, but less processor intensive? And then they changed it. And, and so I think race flight will always be around as long as Kalen wants to you just have this place where he can play and do his own development. And, and the great thing is that beta flight, you know, since it's an open source project and since he's contributing can also benefit. So we can all benefit regardless. Yeah. Um, third party modules that fit the attitude V4S. Funny you ask that Matt Fullen. what I've got right here. This is a furious uh, V3 module. 
in oh it's upside down in the fat shark uh, attitude v4s and as you can see it fits but the stock plastic cover doesn't fit so uh you have to order a special attitude cover which is slightly different in shape but yeah in fact right now the attitude v4 with the true d module is my suggestion for like if you wanted to get into FPV on a budget and you didn't want to buy box goggles, it's I, I go back and forth between like this and the Commander. And I come down on the side of the Attitude because the Attitude has a little bit bigger screen. Uh, and I, I am a big fan of the modules um, because they give you things like band scanner and so forth. But uh, yes, that module will work. Let's see. Yeah, LaForge V4. Go look again on the UBAD page. There's a post up. I reshared it on my FPV Know It All page as well. Can Kalman filter run on the JBF4? Sesher asks. Uh, yes, yes. JBF4 can run the Kalman filter. I posted this video about the Kalman filter and I talked about 32 kilohertz sampling. And the thing about the Kalman filter is that before this new filtering, there was kind of no point in running 32 kilohertz on Betaflight because Betaflight couldn't really take advantage of it. And now that we have the Kalman filter, Betaflight can take advantage of it. But you can still run Kalman filter or on at 8 kilohertz and it still has some advantage. So you can run this Kalman filter code on any flight controller. You just can't run at 32 kilohertz on any... Uh, well, you need the ICM series gyros really to run at 32 kilohertz. I think the 9500 does as well. But the 6000 series gyro, which is the one that's on my flight controller, can't run at 32 kilohertz. It runs, it maxes at 8 kilohertz. Can the sensor of the FPV camera shift inside the case? Asks Dragon Ears. Yes, yes, it can. And in fact, if you've got a vibration, it can sometimes be that the sensor has come loose. Absolutely. Mike J asks, how is the battery testing coming? Uh, the battery testing is coming great. I, I have just started doing the first round of testing. Uh, and if it all goes well, then I'll publish the results. And if I find anything that I need to change, then I will redo it under the new protocol. So this is the, sort of the first beta, if you will, or the first release candidate of my test protocol. And I'm working through it now. It's a little bit slow because I have to, I have to monitor the temperature of the batteries very carefully and I have to leave them in a temperature controlled container for, I'm still trying to figure out the, the, the minimum amount of time to leave them so that the battery is the same temperature all the way through the cells, right? Because temperature affects the results and you can't just wait till the outer surface of the battery it has to be the same temperature all the way through. So right, I, right now I'm, I'm leaving them in the container for like 12 hours, which means I can only run two tests a day which slows me down a lot. So I got to figure out the right way to get this testing done. I mean, but I, I don't see any way it's not going to take me at least five or maybe 10 days to finish a test run on a single battery because I have to put it back in the container and let it rest and come to temperature and then I can test it again. So am I testing any of the newer Max Amps batteries? Yeah, I would love to test Max Amps batteries, but... I have not had good results from Maxamps batteries, and I've been called out by Maxamps on Facebook, who argued with me a little bit. And I try to be really careful what I say about them because I heard a story that they like they sued a, a blogger who who said bad things about their batteries. So I try to be really careful to point out that I am talking only about the one battery that I tested which may or may not even have been a Maxamps battery. All I know is somebody sent it to me in the mail and it had a Maxamps sticker on it. I tested it and it was absolute garbage. So uh, I haven't been impressed. Here's what I have to say about Maxamps batteries. If Let's think of the best battery you could buy, like a really good Thunder Power or a, or a, or a, a Tattoo or just the best battery with a pulse, something that the pro racers run. How much is that battery? It's probably like 35 or 40 bucks. That's a premium price for a battery. And then you go, you've got these Maxamps batteries that are like 70 bucks for a 1300 or something. Well, I don't know the exact price, but it's something like that. It would have to be just inhumanly good to be worth that price. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's why. Well, I'll test them once I got the procedure down. 
Let's see here. Um, I've got some uh, super chats that I'm going to go ahead and take care of. Shai Perednik asked, can you talk about setting motor idle throttle value percent when using D-Shot? I can. And let's just jump onto the flight controller real quick. And let's just make sure you guys know what he's talking about. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, MaxAmps, they sued, a, and this is, I think, I'm not make. I have to be real careful that I'm not saying things that are inaccurate that are then going to get me sued. But um, there was a blogger, this was years ago, a blogger who wrote an article about him, and they like, I don't think they actually sued, but they like sent him a nasty gram and he backed down. And then he doesn't mention it anymore. Do a Google search, MaxAmps sued or whatever, and you'll find references to it still. Okay, going back to Shai Perednik's question. Here we are in beta flight and in the configuration tab, we've got this value, motor idle throttle value percent right here, this value right here. And what that is, what that is, is it, if you remember min throttle, that is how slow the motors will go when the throttle is all the way down. Uh, no slower than that. If the motors spin too slowly, they cog, they stop, the, the prop stutters. So the motor idle prevents the, from, from going so slow that the prop stops. And if it did that, you would either just dip an arm and recover, or sometimes you get a spin of death. Uh, the default is high enough for most setups. Occasionally, there's somebody who is getting, uh, the way you'll know your motor idle is too low, is especially if you do a flip or a roll, and at the very end of the flip or roll, you, you just drop out of the sky. Um, and that means that the motor, the motor went to idle as you were in the roll, and then as you went to stop it, it had to spin up, but it was just moving too slowly and it couldn't spin up, and the, the copter death rolls. So that, that might indicate you needed to raise the motor idle throttle value. That's the D-shot parameter. If you're using multi-shot or one-shot or any of the analog protocols, then it's called min throttle, and that actually is, I think that's, is, I think they put that in the GUI. Hold on. Yeah, they put it in the GUI. So it's called min throttle, and it's also in the GUI. Um, so you might raise that if you had the situation I described, death rolls at the end of flips and rolls or other indication that the idle is too low. But in general, I think that the default of 4.5 is high enough for most setups. And if you have to raise it, you, you have an unusual setup or you might have a problem, uh, like, a, like a, a motor or an ESC that has an issue. If you want to tune that value, what you can do is you can try to lower it. But don't just idle the motors on the bench and lower it until they just barely idle. Because it, the problem is that on the bench, the, there's no air moving past the props. So in the air, like if the quad is falling and, and the air is rushing past the prop, it has to work harder to start spinning from idle. So you need a higher idle value in the air than you do on the bench. So what you can do, though, is you, if you really want to tune that, you can reduce that value. You could take it from 4.5 down to 4, down to, down to you know, 3.75. And eventually you'll get to a point where at the end of a flip or roll, you'll either dip an arm or you'll death roll. And then you'll go, okay, that's, that's not good. That's no good. And you'll raise it back up again. But I leave it at 4.5 on most of my quads. I don't feel like I'm, when you drop the throttle, if it's too high, your quad will really float and it won't drop quickly. So I don't feel like I have that problem, so I don't really work to reduce it. If you have to raise it, though, if you are if you have to raise it like to 5 or 6%, maybe that's normal. But if you have to raise it to 7, 8, 10%, something ain't right with your quad, and, and you need to be looking at the motors or ESCs. Vinny FPV mentions, have you tried the new command in Betaflight called VTX Low Power Disarm? It sets the VTX power to 25 milliwatts upon disarm and the desired power on arm. Yeah, that is awesome. That's in Betaflight 3.3, I think, though. It's not yet. It's not in 3.2, is it? I don't think so. Maybe that would be great if it was. Yeah, if you're using smart audio, then the problem is that if you're at 800 milliwatts on your TBS Unify, and you just you plug your battery in, you set your quad down, and then you walk away. After three to four minutes without airflow, then the VTX overheats. And uh, that can happen, depending on the VTX, it can happen at lower output powers too. So what Betaflight will do, I think it's in Betaflight 3.3, it will uh, it'll, it'll set the to 25 milliwatts using smart audio, and then as soon as you arm, it bumps it up. That's pretty cool. 
Alan, Alan Vishkinevsky asked, why does my Mini Quads 4 and 1 ESC think motor 3 is motor 4 and vice versa? I'm going to guess because you soldered the wires wrong. Right, you had the wires coming out of the coming out of the little plug header, and you probably just soldered them wrong. So just flip those two; it doesn't matter. You'll be fine. Super chats. Let's see. We got a lot of super chats here with no question. Thank you guys so much for your donations. Billy Clack, APOC FPV, Bob Sagafi. Billy Clack gives asks any recommendations for storing lipos in a small place. I have a lipo safe bag, but is that enough? They make me nervous. The lipo safe bags are better than nothing. But depending on the size of the fire, they can burn through. The single best thing, in my opinion, for storing lipos is this. It is the BatSafe box. Uh, BatSafe actually sent me one of these. I'm using it for my uh, battery testing because, as you might imagine, I have a higher than average chance of uh, of lighting a battery on fire. It is a, an insulated... I'm trying to find you guys a picture of it. Well, here we got a whole thing here. Can I not full screen it? Really? Come on. Why can't I full screen it? Give me a break. Yeah, bat safe. There it is. So it's got vent holes on top, filter in here so that if a battery does smoke, uh, the smoke will be dissipated as much as possible, and it's insulated so that the heat doesn't light adjacent things on fire. Um, it's it, it, You would have to buy, if you have a lot of batteries, you're gonna not going to be able to store all of them in there. It's more for use when you're charging your batteries. Uh, you can charge them inside it. And in fact, it's got a, a, a pass-through a, a plug and a pass-through, so you can put plug pass wires through the top of the box so you can charge inside the box. But that, if you're really, really concerned about battery fires, that is the single best, I think, way to store and charge your batteries. I will say this. If you get a metal ammo can, um, you know, just if you don't know what that is, search for ammo can metal. And then you can, it'll, it's, it, you can take the, the seal, the rubber seal, the gasket out of the top. But what you can do is you can, the gasket goes all the way around the sides and the front. If you take the gasket out just the sides, then it'll still latch closed and be tight, but it'll have just enough sort of airflow that if there's a fire, the smoke can come out and, and release the pressure. And I've seen a video where somebody lit a battery off inside an ammo can with the, ga the side gasket removed, and it did a really, really good job of containing the fire. A whole bunch of smoke came out, but no fire did a pretty good job. Some people also will get an ammo can and line it with fire-resistant panels, just like, you know, three-quarter inch thick panels that they cut to size and put inside the box just to help with the heat a little bit. So that's another thing you can do. Um, Edrone 9 asks, Hey, Josh, I was wondering what antennas are a good match on FPV goggles when using Pagoda on the quad. The number one thing you want to do is make sure that if you've, like, got a right-handed Pagoda, that you've got a right-handed antenna on the goggles. If you mix right and left-hand circularized antennas, you're not going to get very good reception at all. And that's kind of the whole point of that circularization, that the left and the right don't interfere with each other. So make sure they're both right-handed. Um, you could certainly run a Pagoda. One of the things I've done is I've run the VAS ION, VAS, V-A-S, uh, Video Aerial Systems ION antenna. And the reason I do that is... The VAS ION is a little bit higher gain. Uh, it's not really helpful to see. Let me show you guys the antenna, though. Yeah, here we go. This is the VAS ION. VAS ION antenna. Um, it's got a little bit higher gain. And what that means is that it has a little bit narrower vertical beam width. So instead of being like a sphere, it's kind of like a, a squished balloon. And on the, on the quad... I think that's not the best thing because a mini quad, it pitches forward and you really want, I think, as circular a pattern as you can on a freestyle quad for sure. On a flying wing, it's a little different like because a flying wing is almost always right side up and it may roll left or roll right, but it generally doesn't pitch forward. I mean, it can't. Obviously, if you're in a dive, it's going to pitch forward. But 
on a mini quad, I really want as lo a lower gain antenna, in my opinion, so that you get consistent coverage as the quad changes its orientation. But on the goggles, a higher gain antenna can be good as long as you can remember to keep your freaking head up. If you've got a high gain antenna and it's like this instead of like that, and then you look down at the ground, well, now you're not doing yourself any favors. But I like the Vaz Ion on my goggles, uh, Pagoda on the quad. There's a new, um, Foxeer has a new Pagoda Pro. Hang on. And I just put this on my goggles and I'm trying it out. The problem with Pagodas is that they're real sensitive. These, the discs have to be exactly the right spacing and exactly the right alignment. If they're not pivoted exactly right relative to each other, the, the antenna, the performance goes to hell. And the other thing is they're really fragile. They get banged up really easily. So you can see what Foxeer has done with this Pagoda is they've encased it in plastic. I still am not running any of these on my quad yet, uh, but this is the first Pagoda I've seen that I feel reasonably confident that maybe it won't just get beat to crap. The only question with the Pagodas, though, is... Oh, let me spill that on myself. Hang on. The only question with the Pagodas is how is the manufacturing tolerances? Are they coming out of the factory with everything done right? And it's hard to know unless you just test them in the field. But fingers crossed that Foxeer's done a good job with that. Aiden Sylvie asks, what do you think of Flynosaurus? I may be doing an internship there in the summer. Um, Josh Ingram at Flynosaurus, is, he's, he's a cool guy. He has some really awesome, innovative frame designs. Uh, great for racing, for sure. Um, so, yeah, do, do, do that internship. They're, they're all right. He actually has started a program he's trying to get going that is you it's a stem program for for kids in elementary and high school and middle school using drones to teach physics I don't know and he's trying to get that going so that, that also is a cool project if anybody out there is in in uh, education and you know middle school elementary school high school education not at the not at the college level of course um, you might, and you're interested in something like that, get a hold of him, Josh Ingram at Flynosaurus, and see if that might be something you'd be interested in. Um, let me now, let's see. James Grow in the regular chat, these have all been super chats. Uh, James Grow in the regular chat asks, I have an HDLRC F440 stack and they won't calibrate in beta flight. Also, BL Heli does not show any of them. Uh, when I arm without props, the quad will dance left to right. Okay, well, the, let's let's try let's figure these problems out. Um, the the ESC is not calibrating. Uh, if you're running D shot, of course that won't you you can't calibrate D shot. So maybe that's your problem. Uh, are you running D shot? Uh, I don't know. Um, if you're not running D shot, give it a try because not D shot. You don't have to calibrate. It doesn't. There's no such thing as calibration in D-Shot, and therefore it just sort of sidesteps that whole issue. I would almost, cons I would almost, if you were like a noob and you just didn't, what's this calibration thing? My ESCs are being weird. I would almost suggest you just run D-Shot 150, which most ESCs should be able to do. Even though it has less performance than multi-shot at 32 kilohertz, it just sidesteps so many issues that you could run into. Um... Alan Vishenevsky, I answered your question about mini quads 4 and one ESC, so I don't know if you missed that, but you'll have to go back in the DVR. You don't have to ask it anymore, though. Um, so then, not calibrating. Usually not calibrating suggests that the ESC is not understanding or seeing the throttle signal, um, which you, if you're using D-shot but the ESC doesn't support D-shot, well, that certainly you wouldn't get a calibration there. Um and then BL Heli not showing any of them also kind of suggests that maybe the signal connection is not present. So it's a stack. So you shouldn't be too many ways to screw up the signal connection. But nevertheless, it, maybe it's screwed up. It's sounding like your ESCs are not connected to your flight controller is the bottom line. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to make a DIY high def FPV setup? Tokimoto asks, can you make a DIY high def FPV setup? And the answer to that is no, not with that, not with latency that is worth flying. See, the problem is you have to have really low latency, especially for racing and proximity freestyle. If you're flying a, a flying wing at, you know, 399 feet, because you wouldn't go above 400 feet, right? Yeah. 
if you're doing that kind of thing where latency is not as big of a deal or where if you've got an autonomous craft where it's flying on GPS and you're kind of just inputting commands to the autopilot, then latency is not such a big deal and high def video is relatively easy. Uh, and that's why DJI can get four miles range out of their digital video link to the Mavic or what are the Inspire because the latency, they don't have, it has terrible latency, but you don't care because that's not what you're doing. Um, there are various wireless high def systems that you could cobble onto a quad, but they're all going to have such high latency, it's not going to be usable. And even some of the tailor made high def video, video systems like um, uh, DJI OcuSync is one that I've just been testing, uh, and uh, oh, Connex Pro Site. And I haven't, I haven't seen FPV Blue, but I'm going to bet it's the same. Even those guys still struggle to get the latency down to something flyable and have to give up a lot to get it. Like they have to go down to 1080i or, 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 or 640 by 480 in the case of the DJI OcuSync. So no is the answer. You just not, it's not going to happen. Let's see. Alan... Elena Vishkinski, you, you might not have repeated your question. The questions might just be coming in slower than I thought, or my questions might not have updated. I apologize if I accused you of repeating the question uh, incorrectly. Yeah, I think my, oh yeah, I think my live chat just wasn't updating. Oh, I was like, where are all the channels? <laughs> I mean, the comments, where are all the comments? Guillermo, I am drinking, uh, this is the Powerade Zero that I used to be using as ballast on my camera stand. Now I'm not using it as ballast, and I'm drinking it. Thoughts on the new Strix Hoot antenna? Fran, Fran, uh, when I missed your question, Fran Galasso asks, I'm going to show you guys this, although it doesn't really tell you much about what's going on on the inside. This is the Hoot antenna from Strix. I'll tell you what, I've been flying with this on a couple quads. I still haven't done any rigorous range testing on it. Um, it's not bad. It's hard to say more than, yeah, I haven't noticed it sucking until I do some more rigorous stuff. Because, of course, what you want to know is, is it really good? And that's hard to tell just from putting it on a quad and flying it. But it's not bad. I really like that the design is, I mean, the design is really robust. I mean, it's, 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 so far it's been pretty hard to break. It's really solid. So that's certainly something to look for in an antenna. Um... Uh, the in as far as the inside, it's supposed to have this really. What's I forget the name of it. Somebody told me the name of the the type of antenna design that's on the inside. I can't remember the name of it, but Lindenblad. That's it, Lindenblad. Hmm, Lindenblad antenna. Yes, that's what it is. So uh, yeah, it's a Lindenblad antenna, and you go look that up and see what that is and why that's awesome. But yeah, that's the Strix Hoot antenna. Uh, so far, so good is what I have to say about that. I'm going to go over to the Patreon post now, and I'm going to take some of the questions off of Patreon. And there are a lot of them. I am not necessarily going to get to all of them. If I don't get to any of your questions on Patreon here in the live stream, I definitely will answer them on the Patreon page. Uh, by the way, you guys probably know this, but I have a Patreon. Um, yeah, here. This is as good a time as any. I know. It's worth we're like 40 minutes in. Uh... Yeah, I have a, so I have a Patreon, right? You knew that. Some of you didn't know that. Some of you, hi, some of you, this is your first live stream. You just started watching my videos. Hey, welcome. You're learning, you're going to learn something. That's my tagline. And I have a Patreon and I do this full time. I answer you guys' questions. I answer, I get so many emails since I went full time. It's unreal. Uh, so one of the ways that you guys, and in fact, this is the best way that you can support me is by becoming a patron, even at like the $1 level. Um, because, uh, it, 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 that just adds up. If there's enough people, it just adds up and becomes something uh, that, that I can make a living off of. So, uh, yep, you can, it's the Drone Racing Engineer on Patreon. And uh, definitely, uh, if you feel like doing that, that's great. Um, so here are some questions from the patrons. Any general tips for tuning 6-inch? No. I have no experience tuning 6-inch. But I have something interesting to say about that. And that ties into another question that somebody asked on the Patreon, which is what's with this new trend of doing uh, 6S batteries 
with low kV motors. So here's the deal. Our, the motor's RPM is the voltage times the kV, right? So if you take a higher voltage and a lower kV, you end up at the same RPM but lower amps and maybe better performance or different performance. So, so this is something that uh, I'm going to be experimenting with. Uh, Catalyst Machine Works is going to send me two of their Murica quads, and one of them is going to have like 2,600 kV motors on it for 4S, and one's going to have like 1,700 kV motors on it for 6S. And then we're going to fly them, uh, and I've actually, I've, I'm not, uh, I've got a, uh, a local racing pilot. Well, since I'm not a top racer, I'm going to have him ring them out and see what the difference is. So I'm looking forward to that and looking forward to tuning 6 inch, uh, 6S and so on. So, um, but I see here actually Jason Tan asked general tips for tuning 6 inch, not 6S. And that's a little different. 6 inch tuning, uh, you're going to have lower RPMs. You're going to have more issues with vibration because of the larger props and lower RPMs. So you may not be able to remove as many filters. And you're going to need much torquier motors. You're going to have a harder time getting rid of prop wash oscillation. Uh, with the right motors and the right battery, you can still get really, really good performance. But it is a little bit of more of a struggle to tune a 6 inch than it is a 5 inch. Uh, if you're looking for just like the ultimate sort of no prop wash oscillation and so on. Um, that being said, motors and ESCs have come a long way, a long way. And uh, so uh, you, I think that, that it's all oh, you could get almost as good a tune out of that six inch as you, as you used to be able to get out of a five inch. You just have to make sure you're picking the right motors. The other thing with six inches, if you've got a six inch tri blade like a 6045, you're going to draw a ton of current out of your battery. I'm sorry about that, guys. Unless you uh, unless you reduce the kV a lot, so uh, you're definitely going to need to either go go bi blade or if you go tri blade, use lower kV or use just a, a really impressive battery. Morgan asks tips and tricks for protecting a GoPro. Any specific mounts, lens protectors, etc. I know a lot of guys use those tempered glass stick-on lenses on the front. I never could figure out how to get that thing to stick without having some, you know, some air bubbles in it. I don't know if I just did it wrong or what. So a lot of people swear by those tempered glass lens protectors, though. Um, the other thing I use is I use a TPU case that I put it in. And the nice thing about the TPU case is, here it is. The nice thing about the TPU case is that it's got these little things here that the battery strap can pass through, which makes it a little harder for the, the session to slip out and go flying in a crash. So that's another thing I do. Session four versus session five. Session four is a great budget choice now that you can get a refurbished session four for 149 bucks. It'll do 1080, I think it'll do, pardon me. I think it'll do 1080, 60 super view, which is, it'll still definitely do 1080, 30, which is kind of the minimum you need. The, the session five will do 2.7K. Uh, and it'll do 90 frames per second at 1080, if my memory's correct. But the Session 4, if you had 150 bucks to spend, it'd be hard to do a lot better, especially because you can get it at Best Buy and take advantage of the Best Buy warranty, which we're all going to destroy. They asked me when I got my Best Buy warranty on my Session, they said, do you want the two-year, the one, the two, or the three-year warranty? And I said, ha, 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 this thing's not going to make it past a year. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'll take the one year, so... Let's see here. Big D Boston asks, what do you think about the microwave dipole upgrade for the Tyrannus by Vaz? My impression of that dipole upgrade is that it was designed to deal with the situation where the antenna was sticking straight out and was horizontal parallel to the ground. That with like um, one of the older spectrum radios like the DX6, the antenna was fixed. And so if you held the radio like most of us hold it, it was parallel to the ground and that had an effect on the coverage. And the folded dipole fixed that. My impression was that if you have an antenna that folds up like the Tyrannus does, that there isn't as much advantage to the folded dipole. But I could be wrong about that. Let's see here. Eddie Mavesky over on Patreon asks... Betaflight 3.3 is around the corner. And what's the deal with the smart audio bug? So let me uh, 
Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So I'm, I'm just reading the comment. Let me um, let me just recap the issue here. Um, in Betaflight 3.2, there is a bug in the implementation of smart audio. And the bug doesn't affect like the TBS Unify. It's a harmless bug. The AKK video transmitters and the Race Day Quads Mach 2 based their smart audio implementation on the Betaflight code, which means that they depend on the bug being present. Betaflight 3.3 is going to fix the bug, and when they fix the bug, then the Race Day Quads Mach 2 and the AKK video transmitters, when Betaflight 3.3 comes out, then the smart audio won't work on them with Betaflight 3.3. You follow all that? Um, and then, so then people said, well, Betaflight, why don't you just not fix the bug or give us a command line option to make the bug still be there so our stuff still works? And the Betaflight devs' response, a lot of people are hostile to their response, but uh, I, I'm not, and I'll tell you why. Their response is, we're not going to do that. We're going to fix the bug, and we're going to implement the protocol correctly. And everybody says, well, come on. It's just one line of code. Why don't you just let our hardware continue to work? And they say the problem is that we get we have 50 different bugs. Vendors have have implemented hardware in a bu and they, it's buggy and they want us to fix it. And it's not just this one video transmitter that is in this situation. It's a, it's ESCs, it's a whole flight controllers and if they went out of their way to fix every bug that every manufacturer they they say the manufacturer has to fix the bug. It's not our fault that they didn't follow the spec. The spec is available. They could have followed it. Everything would have been fine. So they refused to do that. Um, what I know about it is this. Um, Tyler Brennan at Race Day Quads said, we're going to come up with a fix before Betaflight 3.3 comes out. And he said, if we don't come up with a fix, I'll replace every single one of these units with a new one that works. I can, yeah. So as far as I'm concerned... You know, uh, Betaflight 3.3 is, I think it's targeted for March, which is still a little bit of a ways off. And if Betaflight 3.3 comes out as it gets closer, we'll see what happens. I'm not aware of any fix right now. I'm skeptical that a fix is going to happen because I don't think these, uh, these video transmitters will be easy to upgrade in the field. I don't think they have a bootloader. So that means you can't just flash them over the smart audio pin. Like you can some some flight controllers, so I I'm not sure what the fix is, but for the time being, I'm counting on the fact that Race Day Quads at least is a stand up vendor, and if they say they'll make it right with their customers, I I have faith that they will, and I hope I hope that they live up to that. Um, Eddie Mavsky says that the solution provided by AKK sucks. They offer 50% off new units, or you can send the unit back to them for repair. I guess it's nice that they're letting you send it back to them for repair. you got to pay for shipping, I suppose, but they will, I guess, put the new code on it. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that, as you say, the, the updated units are coming soon if they're not out already, so they will, they will be fixed soon if you buy them going forward. So, All righty. Mm, there you go, Eddie. I talked about it for a few minutes. Let's see what it is. Let's see. JD Began, does it bother you that you've made it impossible to locate a FreeSky X9D Plus SE anywhere in the world? I hope that I can take credit for that. <laughs> I don't know about that. If using a 4-in-1 ESC, are you able to use low ESR capacitors? And if so, how do you tell the plus from the minus? On an on a, on a electrolytic capacitor... Uh, there's a stripe down the side that's the negative leg. Uh, and it's oftentimes marked minus, minus, minus. The other thing is on, on polarized through-hole components, there'll be a long leg and a short leg. And the long leg is the positive leg always. I'm 99% sure that's right. So that's the two things there. <coughs> Let's see here. Yeah, APOC FPV points out Kalman is going to be improved soon with a full dynamic Kalman filter. Yeah, so the implementation of Kalman filter that we have played with so far is actually not a full Kalman filter. And without getting too deep into the math, because if I do, I'll expose my ignorance. Kalman filter is kind of 
adaptive. It feeds back into itself and adapts and and adjusts itself in real time to the noise characteristics that it's filtering. And the common filter that is currently in beta flight doesn't do that. And that's why some people have said it's not really a common filter. It's just a low pass, just an effective low pass. But um, Kalen has, he said, I got 20 more back in the back in the can that I that we're not testing yet. And they are working on implementing the full adaptive common filter. Dominic Lalonde, you guys are talking about the RXSR receiver. Uh, I released a video when I, the RXSR was first introduced. I released a video saying the new best free sky, free sky receiver. And I, I tried to be clear in the video that, I mean, nobody had them yet, but on paper, it was the best. It was, it had everything. It was small. It was cheap. It had redundancy. It had everything you could want. It even had, it even had the inversion pads on it. So you could easily get at the uninverted signal. Unfortunately, RXSRs have been a huge hassle if you use telemetry and or, or Lua scripts, which require telemetry, they've been a huge hassle from the beginning. If you get them today, a lot of times telemetry doesn't work, Lua scripts don't work, and you have to flash them, which is a which is a, a, a pain. Some people install them in the quad, and then after they've installed them, they find out it doesn't work. They have to desolder it to flash it. I don't actually put RXSRs in my quads. I'm still using the X4R SB, if you can believe that. Because it just freaking works. I wish that the firmware issues on the RXSR would get straightened out and it would be bulletproof reliable. I would switch to it, but so far I haven't. On my JBF4 board, asked Sean Riley, the 7.6 volt or 9 volt pad looks like it says 5 volt. Am I crazy or what? No, it doesn't say 5 volt. It's just the 9. I think the, if you're just looking at the silk screen, the 9 is just messed up a little bit on the silk screen. Sorry about that. Put a multimeter on it and see what it actually outputs, though. Let's see here. Matthew Spradley asks, can a bad tune cause noisy video? It's only noisy when armed. Yes, absolutely. So video noise is electrical noise, right? But the thing with a quadcopter is that because the, you've got a PID loop and a gyro, there's a feedback loop between the physical vibration, which is also called noise, confusingly, between the physical vibration and the electrical noise. What happens is that as the motor spins, it makes vibration. The gyro picks up that vibration. The gyro reads out into the PID loop. The PID loop responds to the vibration and tells the ESCs to spin the motor differently. So there's this feedback loop where physical vibration manifests as electrical noise. And so if you've got a quad and the video is only noisy when you arm the motors, that's definitely something that could be caused by your flight controller, that uh, you're not imagining it. So what can you do if you've got that situation? Noisy video only when you arm. Uh, you can add a capacitor or add individual capacitors if you're using separate ESCs. Add like a 330 microfarad 25 volt for four for four cell i would use 25 volt capacitor to each of the escs electrolytic low esr capacitor add it to each of the escs um uh you could soft mount the flight controller although if you get noise like as soon as you arm when the quad is just idling then that's probably not it because the motors just aren't making that much noise it's probably not vibration and the other, other things it can be is uh, excess D gain. Although again, that's usually going to happen when you throttle up, not just as soon as you arm. Uh, excess D gain can cause noise. You'll probably also have hot motors. But mostly, most of the time, if I've got a situation like this, the problem can be solved by changing the wiring of the flight control of the uh, video transmitter and the camera. So if they're running off a of regulator, try running them off of the the battery voltage directly. If they're running off battery voltage, try running them off a of regulator. Make sure that the camera and the video transmitter are grounded to the same place. Maybe put them on the same regulator or both on VBAT. It's kind of trial and error what's going to work the best, but those that usually figures it out for me. But the, the nuclear option is ESC on each of the four, uh, uh, sorry, a capacitor on each of the four ESCs. That almost always cleans it up for me. That's pretty weird. Keaton Merrick, your question about your current sensor is really weird. I'll try and get that back. back. I don't know the answer to that. 
Mike Miller asks, do you think it's possible that we could see flight controllers with self-adjusting PIDs? Um, I think what we're going to see is flight controllers with better and better PID controllers to the point where default PIDs fly so freaking good that we stop thinking about tuning unless we're, you're, you're the exception rather than the rule. That's what I think we're going to see. Bean FPV asks, why does one motor go to 100%? Here, so let's say you're looking at black box, you, you're getting desyncs, you're getting death rolls, and then you, you, you look in black box and you see that a motor goes to 100%. Here's what that means. It doesn't mean that the motor went to 100%. What it mean, the analogy I like to use is if you were in a car driving on the highway and your brakes went out, what would the black box show that your foot was doing to the brake at the moment before you crashed? You'd be standing on the brake as hard as you could trying to get the car to stop. And that's what it means in black box when you see a motor go to 100%. It usually means that when, if it goes to 100%, it just stays there, right? For a motor, if you do a full throttle punch out, a motor will go to 100% and it'll drop back down again. But if it goes to 100%, it just stays there. That, that usually means the motor has actually stopped making thrust. So then the question is, why did it do that? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, you say, Bean FPV says, I've discovered some oomph Titan motors with loose stators. Yeah, well, that would do it. Absolutely, that would do it. So I think we actually talked about this on my live, uh, my patrons video call. So I think we actually addressed this. Um, Matthew Cape asks, is it possible to have two different pads sending an LED signal or do they have to be run in series off of one resource? Yeah, you could do you could do that, but I don't think Betaflight supports it. So Betaflight only supports the one LED strip uh, wire and they all have to be run off the same source. A.A. Ron asks, a UFL connector fell off the Unify. What's a quick fix? You can solder it back on if you're good, or you can direct solder. The, the You can strip the wire and you can direct solder it. You have to know how, though. Look up my video, depinning a uh, TS5875. Hang on. Uh, is it 5825? Hang on. Yeah, 5825. How to depin your FPV video transmitter. I show how to solder the solder it. Um, you'll need to do that. Assuming you didn't lift a pin. Uh, a pin. Billy DFPV asks, do you see a reason for F7 processors right now? Um, I still I still feel fine about F4s. I, the Betaflight devs are working hard to make sure that Betaflight 3.3 can work on F4s without overclocking. So I think that means we have at least nine months before you'll see a version of Betaflight that has to be like you have to give anything up at all to run on an F4. And the problem is right now there are so few F7 flight controllers available. There's a few. There's a few good ones. Like I'm a really big fan of the Maytech F722. Uh, just because I like Maytech flight controllers in general. They do a good job. But I just, I'm not sure I would want to commit to a flight controller right now when there are so many good F4s. Uh, on the other hand, the whole deal with FreeSky inversion and SmartPort is so freaking annoying. Maybe I would do it. So, No plans right now, John Carlton, for a V2 of my F4 board. I, we have ideas about things we want to do in the next revision. Uh, we did we did change the voltage regulator from 7.6 to 9 volts. We found that there were some video transmitters that were supposed to be good down to 7.2 volts. And so we're at 7.6, so should we, we should be fine. But there were some video transmitters that had problems. Even though the voltage regulator wasn't, when we could we put it on a scope and looked, it wasn't dropping. So we, by taking the voltage regulator up to 9 volts, we improved the compatibility. But other than that, you know, no 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 plans right now. Let's see. Joshua Jones asks, I've been building three to four inch quads uh, using DYS Mini F4 flight controller paired with DYS 4 in one ESC. I've run through three of these ESCs where they seem to lose a couple motors after the first few flights. I've remapped and it has worked, but not other times. How to diagnose and fix with the 4 in one ESC. Man, I don't know. I mean, if the ESC stops driving the motor, it's mostly just a question of trial and error, process of elimination. So you swap the motor, right? And does the new motor work or does it not work? 
Well, if the new motor works, but the old one didn't, then I guess the motor was the problem. But if you swap the motor and the new motor does, also doesn't work, then it's likely the ESC. And you can also swap the signal wires around on the flight controller, right? So if swapping the signal wire moves which motor works, then it means that the signal output or the wire is the problem. And that's kind of how you troubleshoot these things. It's just, it's just process of elimination. Let's see. Pure FPV says, I broke an arm a few hours ago. Pure FPV, I originally thought you were saying you literally broke your arm. So I'm glad that's not the case. I broke an arm a few hours ago and I got lost telemetry and black video feed, but not static. Okay, so let's break this down. If your video goes to static, it usually means if you're flying and you have video and then your video goes to static. It usually means that your video transmitter has powered down. It could mean that your antenna fell off, but usually then you, you won't go to full static depending on how far away you are, I guess. So it usually means that, that your video transmitter has lost power. If you go to black screen, it usually means that your camera has shut down or your camera video signal wire has gotten disconnected or broken, right? And losing telemetry will usually mean that your receiver has shut down. So I'm going to guess that you had some kind of a power outage. And I'm going to guess that your maybe your receiver and your camera were both on 5 volts, but your video transmitter was on VBAT or something like that. And that would cause that. Jan Leanders. I'm guessing that you're a Jan and not a Jan. Jan, if I've mis mistaken that, I apologize. You, you ask, I want to buy an FPV cam for my drone. What do you recommend? I'm so glad you asked. That is the perfect time for me because we're now we're going up on the top of the hour and usually halfway through the live stream is where I pause and just do a little commercial break for myself. You know, I do a little plug for myself. And I'll steal that opportunity to plug my website, fpvknowitall.com. Yay! On which you can find, among other things, the ultimate FPV shopping list, which is people keep asking me all the time, what do you recommend? What should I buy? What should I buy? And here is the answer. I made a whole website out of all, not everything. I got more stuff. I'm still working on it. But tools, quadcopter parts, FPV equipment. So for example, if you want to know the camera I recommend, we can go to FPV equipment. We can click FPV cameras and I'll give you a little background information, a little history about my sort of my thought processes. And then I break them down like the cheapest worth having or the best, you know, a little, little, little three or four paragraph editorial review. Um, so, yeah. So what I would say is look through this and see which one of these things fits your personal preferences. There you go. FPV know it all. I will also mention as long as we're here and as long as we're at the top of the hour in my little commercial break. I would also mention that over here in the about screen, there is a support me, <laughs> support me page where you can find the various ways that you can support me. And some of these things, some of these things are literally, you just give me money, like, uh, like the subscribe to my Patreon. But some of these things, you know, you kind of are already doing like subscribe to my channel or use my affiliate links. And I, I, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to educate people that when you use affiliate links, whether they're mine or anybody else's, you don't have to buy the exact item that's linked to. You can click on any of these affiliate links before you make any purchase at any of these vendors. And I'll get a commission on the purchase, a small commission. Um, and you could do that for anybody you want to support. If they have affiliate links, click them before you make a purchase and they get a small commission. It costs you nothing. If you're one of those cryptocurrency weirdos, you can even send me cryptocurrency. I don't know what I'll do with it, but years from now i'll have three bitcoins and i'll make a zillion dollars yay i don't know okay anyway that's enough of that that's enough of that oh man let's see hi caleb is cool i notice you <laughs> there you go aaron allegria asks josh what's your opinion on new batteries on the market claiming c rating of 100 plus c well I think it's probably BS. It's just a marketing game. But that's why the battery tester is going to is going to separate the, the the wheat from the chaff. 
Um, a couple people have asked uh, about how's the battery testing going, and I, I mentioned this earlier in the stream, but I'll mention it again because so many people gave so much money to me to buy this stupid battery tester, and it's been almost two months, and people are going, "Where's the whatever happened with that? I'd like to remind you, I told you when I ordered it that they had to special order the, the big amplifier, the, the most important part, and that it would be like the end of January or February before you saw any results. So I'm on track. Okay, we're on schedule. I'm just now doing the first round of testing to see if the protocol, the test protocol works out. I hope that this produces some results that I can publish hopefully around the early February if I find a problem with the test protocol, I'm not going to rush and release the results. I'm going to stop. I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to do it. I really want these results to be the best they can be. So if I get halfway through the protocol and I realize, oh, there's a mistake. I need to change something. I'm going to go back and do it again. But I'm, I'm currently on track to get something published, the very first round of testing published, sometime probably in early February, which is on schedule. But, uh, yeah. Going back to the Super Chat. Kyron FPV gives 10 pounds, 10 pounds, British pounds sterling, and asks, I'm fixing my friend's drone. Three motors working, the fourth doesn't spin normally. Tried everything, reflashing, calibrating, resoldering, change, mapping. Have you changed the motors? I mean, that's you, you, you don't want it to be the motor, but at the end of the day, you can try everything you want to try, and usually when one motor doesn't spin right, it's that the motor's damaged. So swap the motor out. If you don't have a spare motor, swap it with one of the other motors on the quad. See if it spins. If you have the same problem with D-Shot or One-Shot, that kind of suggests that it's not. Like it could be that the ESC doesn't like D-Shot. But if you have it with D-Shot and One-Shot, that's probably not the issue. So I would swap the motor with one of the other motors and see if that fixes it. Yes, yeah, Scallywag, uh, the big fat phonies. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. That's the, Scallywag, that's the other reason I want to be so careful with the battery testing. Because people are going to, they're going to listen. And if I say a given battery performed badly, like I really feel like I, you remember when I did the antenna testing and TBS got really up in arms about my procedures. And I, I redid a lot of the procedures to try and make, you know, stand by the results. But, um, I want to be able, if I say a battery is bad, I'm going to get a lot of heat for it. I want to make sure that the test is as airtight as it possibly, possibly can be so I can stand by the results. Let's see. Mm, oh, it's a Polish name. I can't pronounce Polish names. I'm sorry. Janowski. Janowski asks on Patreon, I have an Axie left-hand polarized UFL antenna. Let me show you guys this antenna. This is a great an this is a great little antenna. So here's the thing about UFL connectors and MMCX connectors, right? You got this connector on your flight controller, but the problem is that you then, what do you do with it? You just have an SMA pigtail, then you have a big heavy antenna, right, with an SMA connector. But GetFPV makes this little guy and this is pretty cool. Come on now. Get in there. There. No, not that one. Not that one. Come on. There we go. So it's an Axie antenna with a UFL connector directly on it that plugs right into the back of your flight controller or your, your video transmitter. That's pretty cool. They also make an MMCX version as well. And what uh, Mr. Janowski is asking about is converting a UFL to an MMCX. That can be done, but I'm going to guess if you're asking that question that you don't have the tools and the technique to properly install an MMCX connector. So I would say I, it's not as simple as just snip solder done. You have to be able to do it right. And if you don't do it right, then you could get bad, bad video or you could even potentially damage your video transmitter. So I would just buy one and that would be, that would be what I'd do. Can't, Jacob Bowen asked, with all-in-one ESCs where pads are coming out of the side, can you solder to the bottom as well? Yeah, no, that's fine. As long as there's a pad down there, and there usually is, you can solder to the bottom. No problem. Is it possible, Sam Day asks, again, in the Patreon, well, almost through the Patreon questions, by the way, is it possible to remap any flight controller pad to use for current sensing? No, that you are correct. It needs to be 
uh, pad connected to an ADC, an analog to digital converter pin on the actual processor. So on the processor, the F4 or the F3 or the F7, there are pins and those pins are pre-assigned internally to certain resources and they're not arbitrarily remappable. So some of them have a connection to an analog to digital converter and that's what's used for RSSI current sensing and there's one more function that uses the ADC and I'm blanking on what it is. So if you have a flight controller with an RSSI pad, you can remap it to a current sensor or vice versa, but you can't remap like an RSSI pad to a motor output. It doesn't work that way. Daniel Mauerer asks, any new thoughts on the Lumineer Popo system? Have you tested it yet? I have one flight on the Lumineer Popo system, and it was the test flight that I did with the DJI OcuSync on it. If you go check out my Instagram, I have an Instagram of Joshua Bardwell on Instagram. Um, I just recently started posting over there again, so uh, I've been trying to up my social media game. And I hear that the kids these days aren't on Facebook, or they're all over on Instagram Snapchatting each other, their privates, or I don't know what I, I don't know anything about this stuff. But um, I try, so I'm trying to kick up my Instagram presence. If you guys want to go over there and subscribe to me, that'd be great. Um, so I posted a pic over there today of the quad that I put the DJI OcuSync transmitter on, and the thing is freaking. It's kind of, I mean, it's not big for a, it's big, it's big for a video transmitter. And I just freaking took electrical tape and went because I really didn't want to lose it. So the same quad with the Popo motors also has the DJI OcuSync on it. And I did the test flight of the OcuSync with the Popo motors. So it was not the most aggressive flight. I will be flying those and, you know, and trying to put them through the ringer and seeing how they perform. One of the things people said, now, did you see the video I made about the Popo motors? If you didn't see that, then uh, go check it out. It's on my, it's on my site. Uh, it's called Never Prop Nut Again is the, uh, is the, is the thumbnail. It's a new quick change motor, uh, quick change prop system from Lumineer, where you just like push a button, the prop pops off, and so forth. And and people have raised some good questions about it. Uh, and as I said in the video, time will tell. I am absolutely confident that if Lumineer says we tested it, we're ready to sell it, that they aren't just like, like let's compare Lumineer to Airbot. And I don't mean to pick on Airbot, but a lot of times the first generation of an Airbot product has an issue. Sometimes they're great. Usually the second generation is really good. But the first generation of an Airbot product is kind of a crapshoot in my opinion. Whereas Lumineer, I feel pretty confident that they've tested it. It doesn't mean that it's 100% though. Like let's think about, let's say that you got 50 pilots to test, test your product. That would be a pretty big number for a lot of these companies. And yet still, you're going to sell 2,000 of them. So... As soon as the product hits the market, it's a real trial by fire. And you can just do, and this is true for my flight controller too. We tested it as thoroughly as we could and we felt it was good, ready to go to market. And then some of these video transmitters that people were using that because, you know, you only have a test pool that's so big, some of these video transmitters didn't like the 7.6 volts and we had to switch over to 9 volts. So it happens. And it's certainly possible that the Popo motors will hit the market, they'll sell a thousand of them, and they'll find, oh, well, you know, it turns out there was something about this that didn't work so well. But I, for the time being, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. People say, oh, what about dirt getting in the little button, the little mechanism? Guys, it's the exact same mechanism that you use on air hoses. There's a million other places this same type of mechanism is used. And those places are not like pristine surgical suites. So I think it should be okay. But time will tell. Um, VBAT sensing is the third one. Sam Day, thank you for pointing that out. VBAT sensing is the third of the ADC pins that you can use. And the reason that I didn't think of it is that usually the VBAT sensor is in use by the flight controller to, to do VBAT sensing. So you wouldn't want to reassign that. John Talarico asks, would the Sam Gook DYS 2207 motors be too much for a four inch quad? Yes. I can't imagine any world where a 2207 motor is necessary to spin a four inch prop. It's going to be horribly underpropped, inefficient, and heavy. That's my opinion. Let's go back over. I, I've been reading Patreon, Patreon posts. Let's go back over to the regular chat here. Let's see. I'm going to scroll back through and see what I missed. 
EV200D. Somebody asked, when am I going to review the EV200D goggles as soon as they send me one? That's the bottom line. Um, sometimes a product is interesting enough that I buy it out of pocket. But, I, you know, I, people got a really negative reaction to me talking about the, free, the Top Sky goggles. I'll, what the heck, I'll put my foot in it again. I'm never afraid to put my, you know, my foot in my mouth. Just keep eating, right? Um, I, when I did, when I did the, talked about the Top Sky F7X goggles, I said that I reached out to Top Sky and asked them if they would send me a review copy, a review set of the goggles. And they said that they weren't giving any review copies out, that I had to pay for it. And I said, I did not say, how dare you? I am a YouTuber. Have you not heard of me? I don't buy equipment. That's not what happened. What I said was, if you're not sending review copies out, maybe that you got something to hide. Maybe you're not real confident. I don't know. Um, and and it turned out that, that they were kind of crappy. And I was right. So, but people people heard me say, you know, that I didn't want to buy one, I, that, that they sent it to me, that they wouldn't send it to me. And they thought I was like, I'm too good to buy some. That's not true at all. Um, I bought the... Um, uh, the uh, Tyrannus uh, X10S, I bought that. And the reason I bought the X10S, I'll tell you why. When somebody sends me a product, especially a really expensive product, I feel bad if I pan it. If I, I mean, I still do it because I have integrity as a reviewer, but I feel bad because the, nobody wants to send you a $500 piece of gear and have you just rip the crap out of it and, and, then, and then they don't sell any. Obviously, vendors send you gear because they want to sell it and they hope that you'll think it's good. So since I didn't like the Tyrannus X12S, the, 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 the Horus, the Horus X12, I was so trepidatious about the X10 that I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy it out of pocket. And that way, if I hate it and tear the shit out of it, I don't have to feel guilty. <laughs> I don't have to have any second thoughts. So that's 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 where I'm at on that. But um, yeah, the EV200... They, they're supposed to be sending it to me. Um, I have the pre-order in to get them, but the, the vendor I'm getting them from doesn't have any of them to send me. So that's when I'll review them. Solarix101 asks, can I use GPS with your flight controller? Yes, but GPS needs a UART and needs a TX and an RX pad is my understanding. On my flight controller, the only UART that has both TX and RX broken out on the board is UART 4. So if you're using UART 4 for anything else, then no, you can't use GPS. One of the things that I would like to do it when eventually we get around to making a, a next rev of the board is I'd like to see a few more uh, UARTs available for Crossfire users and for GPS users. But the first gen of the board, we really tried to make it be kind of focused and not just a kitchen sink approach. And maybe, maybe the second rev will back that off a little bit. Let's see. Any review about the new Sky Zone goggle? Yeah, I talked a little bit about it at the beginning of the stream, the new Sky Zone Sky 03. Uh, so you can watch that. I'm going to be working on the review of this next week, hopefully. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. Let's see. I have Dan Pelkey back over on Patreon asks, I have the HDLRC F440 with BLH32. Uh, after running on 4S, I get the flip of death on throttle punches. Up to my digital idle, and at 20% it works. Yeah, why so high? So first of all, Dan, 20% on digital idle is way too high. Way too high. That's like if somebody said, yeah, my car works fine. I mean... I have to press the throttle. I have to press the throttle. I have to press the accelerator halfway down to the floor just to get it going, but it's working okay. No, it's not. You have a problem. So, um, if you have flips of death, the first thing I suggest is raising the digital idle. And if that didn't fix it, I mean, if you raise it a little bit and the problem goes away, fine. But if you have to raise it to like more than like let's say seven percent, I just pulled that number out of thin air, then you probably have an issue. The next place I would go is the motors. I, and what I would look for is, does the quad always fall the same direction? You can see this in the DVR footage usually. At, at the moment where it starts to dip, look for, does it dip front and to the left, front and to the right, back to the left, etc. If it usually goes the same direction, 
swap that motor. And if that doesn't fix it, swap that ESC. If it constantly rolls random directions, that's a little harder. Maybe that your ESCs as a whole just don't like your motors. It's hard. That's a little harder to judge. But usually those death rolls like that are not a flight controller issue. Usually they are, but something between the ESC and the motor. Pure FPV. I see your question. It looks like you're... Pure FPV. It was after the crash. Lipo was still plugged in. I'm afraid to plug in again. I feel a pad may have listed and caused a short. So glad it wasn't my... Oh, you're talking about the, the arm broke. Pure FPV. I got to go back and look. I've forgotten your question. In fact, I'm not sure I answered your... Did I answer your question, Pure FPV? Because I think maybe I just got off on a tangent. Let's see... I see your, your response, but your original question has scrolled off the top and is gone. So. Any reason why your Tyrannus couldn't update firmware on your XM Plus? I don't know about that. How do you adjust the throttle endpoints to a knob on OpenTX? Like limiting throttle using a knob or slider. Zero gravity, you can do that in OpenTX. And the way that you need to do that is with a thing called global variables. What you'll do is you will set a global variable to be equal to the slider position and you will set the endpoint or the scaling, I think, to be equal to the global variable. And that's all I can tell you right now. I can't walk you through it any better than that. But go look up OpenTX global variables and work from there, and that's how to do the thing you want to do. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Random, for pointing that out. you got to be updating via the back panel. I'm not sure how you were trying to do it if you're like trying to do it from over the air. Tydra FPV says, I'm running a Kakute F4 on a Cop Copus 1. I upgraded the motors to return our R3s. Whenever I go into horizon mode and try to hover, it rolls to the back and to the right. The gyro is fine. Well, the gyro doesn't have a lot to do with... Well, that's not true. I was going to say the gyro doesn't have a lot to do with auto level. It does. The gyro is always working. But it could just be you need to calibrate your accelerometer, right? And I just released a video. Ha ha. just released a video today about calibrating your accelerometer. So go check out my channel. Uh, it teaches you how to calibrate and trim the accelerometer. Let's see here. Dan, yeah, Dan Pelkey says, he had the question about the HDLRC F440 with the digital idle. So if it, he says it always drops towards motor three. So you, you just, the thing to do is to replace motor three. What I would suggest doing is buy a spare, or if you're smart, when you buy motors, you'll always buy five. And if they're, Reverse threaded, if they're clockwise, counterclockwise threads, by six, by an extra of each one. But if they're all standard threads, by five. Always have a spare motor. And what ends up happening to me is I end up either taking the motors off and swapping them out or, or selling the quad or giving it away or whatever, and the spare motor is just sitting there laughing at me. But it's really nice to have a spare motor and not have to wait for shipping. So get a spare motor. Don't throw the old motor out because it could be fine. Put the spare motor on in place of the motor that's suspect and then go fly and see if the problem still happens. Did I cover the Free Sky X light? I don't know. What's the Free Sky? All right. Here, everybody's asking me about the Free Sky X light. Let's look at the Free Sky X light. It looks like a Tango. Is that it? Is that the X light? It just looks like a Tango. No, that's the I. That's the I range X. That's not it. What's the Free Sky X light? I have no idea. What's a, I don't know what that is. Somebody tell me in the chat what that is. Adam Freeman asks, "Do you know if they are working on a BL Heli 32 suite for macOS?" I don't know, but I bet you they're not. They have in the past. I mean, this P 
People have been asking for years for them to make a Mac OS version of Beale Heli Suite, and they basically haven't done it. And I think the reason is that the um, development environment or the language that they use doesn't port very easily, but I don't know. But people have been asking about that since way before BL Heli 32, and they just haven't done it, and I don't think they're going to. So you just have to uh, use Parallels or some other emulator. So people are telling me to look on Instagram. Okay. I'm going to look on Instagram. By the way, a reminder for those of you who just joined the stream. I am on Instagram. I've never plugged it before because I never really used to post there very much. But I'm trying to, now that I'm a full timer, I'm trying to expand my social media presence. And I'm told by people who know that there are, some of you guys are on Instagram and you're not on Facebook at all. And Instagram is just like awesome and I should be there. So I'm trying to post on Instagram at least once a day. I am Joshua Bardwell on Instagram. Here's my nice little headshot. <laughs> and uh, I'm posting there as well. So um, we're going to search for the Free Sky X Lite. No results found. Let's search for Free Sky. See, I don't know how to Instagram. Let's search for Free Sky. Oh, yeah, this is it. Okay. I thought that's what you guys were talking about. So this is a new Free Sky radio they're posting. And it doesn't even look like these are renders. These actually look like physical products that someone owns. So it kind of looks like a giant Xbox controller, doesn't it? But it runs OpenTX. And it's got a D-pad. Of course, it's got a D-pad. Nice. Yeah, I know nothing about this. I know only what you know. Sorry. But it looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Yeah. Ooh. Ah. Uh. Let's see here. Bob Alexander asks, I'm trying to get smart audio working with my Mach 2 video transmitter. I have a seriously Dodo flight controller blast from the past, but still, hey, still perfectly functional. Uh, with the audio on the Mach 2 soldered to pin 5 Soft Serial 1 TX, I select the TBS Smart Audio on ports for Soft Serial 1. My Tyrannus only shows 0 for the band channel power on the Lua script. So, Bob, if you, are, if you have Smart Audio and it is not working via the Lua script, I would want to check to see if it was working via the OSD. But the problem is the Seriously Dota Flight Controller doesn't have an OSD. So, it's going to be hard for you to verify whether Smart Audio is working at all. It sounds like what you've done is correct. Um, you've got it soldered to Soft Serial TX. I would want to look in the resource list command and just verify that Soft Serial is assigned to the correct pin. That's the other thing. What you'll need to do in order to do that, though, is... So here, hang on. I'll show you. What you'll need to do is you go into the command line. Hang on. And you're going to type... You're going to need to save your config. So you're going to type diff and you're going to copy that out and save it to a file. Oh, that's not where, there we go. You're going to save that to a file. Okay. That's going to be a copy of your current config. So save that somewhere safe. And then what you're going to do is you're going to type default. Defaults. That's it. And that will reset the whole thing to defaults. So now you've lost your config, except you saved it to a text file. Okay. Now you're going to go to the command line and you're going to type resource list. And you're going to look for the pin that you put soft serial on. So let's say the pin was um, mot motor output. Uh, let's say it was the LED strip pin, which is resource. Damn it. This thing doesn't have an LED strip. Okay. I'm going to have to make something up. Let's say you put it on the motor 4 pin, which you would never do. But So motor 4 by default is pin A12. So then you're going to do, you're going to go and you're going to paste your diff back in. You're going to copy it back in the diff. So you restore your configuration and you're going to, and part of that will be something like resource serial TX 11 A12. Okay. Okay. So then once you paste your config back in, you're going to remember that pin A12, motor 4, is where you have soft serial, except it's not motor 4 for you. And you're going to type resource list. And you're going to look in that list for A12. And notice that for me, A12 is free. I tried to assign soft serial to it, but it didn't take. Why didn't it take? I don't know. 
I'll bet it's because, aha, aha, see we're troubleshooting your problem right now. You need to go into configuration and enable the soft serial feature and I'll bet you didn't do that. Haha. -ha. No, you must have, damn, no, you must have done that because you said you went into the ports tab and you enabled smart audio on soft serial and you wouldn't see that if the soft serial feature wasn't enabled. So you must have enabled it. But let's go save and reboot. Let's go to the CLI. And now look, yes, okay. So what we see here is that on pin A12, serial underscore TX11, that's what I need to see. For you, it's gonna be whatever pin you meant to put soft serial on. But make sure you've got the right pin number and that you're soldered to the pin you think you are. You follow all that? Okay. And these are all problems that hopefully we won't have to deal with anymore when we have F7 chips because they have like 10 UARTs. And God, I hope manufacturers break them out and make them all usable for us. I am, uh, yeah, okay. Why doesn't Betaflight run on iPads or iPhones? It seems this would be so convenient. One reason is that uh, iOS locks down the USB port in a way that prevents Betaflight, the, the configurator, from accessing it to configure the quad. Um, Android on Android there are, pardon me, on Android there are apps uh, that can configure, but it's not the full Betaflight configurator because that is a Windows app. Uh, so. Oh, great. Thank you, Pure FPV. The black video lost the tree. I couldn't tell if I just went off on a tangent and and uh, and missed it. Let's see here. Cuckoo Glue says, Hey, Josh, just getting into the hobby. I've been practicing on Sims with my PS4 controller. Just received my budget RC controller. It feels really jittery in the Sim. Any insight? Well, that's a tough one. Um, it certainly is possible that the controller itself is jittery. The FSI 6 doesn't have great gimbals, but it doesn't have terrible ones. If you bought the Eosheen, there's an Eosheen version of the FSI 6 that I, I think it has worse gimbals than the actual FlySky FSI 6, even though they look the same on the outside. I think the Eosheen OEM version is worse. You could try adding some deadband in your simulator, though. To, to get rid of the jittery. It might just be that you've never used real gimbals before. Those gamepad controllers are, they're really imprecise because they have such small throw. Games don't need to be terribly precise like like, like, like quads do. So you maybe just aren't used to the gimbals. Uh, maybe you could try reducing your rates. But if literally you mean that when the stick is centered, you see in the, like you're going through the setup wizard and you see that it's jittering like this, even though you're not moving the stick, that's crappy gimbals usually. Um, oh, the other thing it might be, if you are plugged in to an audio interface using the trainer port, that's just that's actually just the way that is. But if you're plugged into USB and you're actually using it as a USB game controller, then the only thing it could be is the gimbals. Let's see. Town C Aviation, uh, I never think it's bad to add capacitors to the ESCs if you have video noise issues. I have never seen a case where that didn't clean them up. I've heard some people say that it didn't work for them, but for me personally, it has always worked. Um, I mean, noise in the system comes from the ESCs. So no matter what else is wrong with the quad, maybe you have a 5-volt regulator that doesn't have good filtering on it. At the end of the day, if the ESCs aren't dumping tons of noise into the system, my gut feeling is that things have to get better. I, it's, that's my opinion. Let's see. Yeah, I, 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 I never got good results using the mic in, input on the PC. There's... There is uh, a program that will let you use the trainer port on the back of the transmitter, and then it'll use the audio interface, the mic input on your computer to read the PPM signal. But it's always super jittery for me and really crappy. I, I, I hate it. Um, yeah. Let's 
Let's see. Is it possible to bind a tiny whoop or newbie drone with a Tyrannus X90 SE EULBT? So the issue is you've got the, the newbie drone Acro B has a free sky uh, receiver in it, but I'm going to bet it doesn't have the EU firmware and you can't bind it to a EU Tyrannus. I'm not sure how you would reflash that. Can I? I wonder if I just a quick Google would tell me the answer. There sometimes is the ability to do an over the air update. Flash Free Sky firmware over the air. Okay, is that possible? If you could do an over the air update, I think it might be possible, but. No, I'm not finding any info about that. Yeah. No, I'm not finding any info about that. Branded Zeps Zapes says, thank you for finally answering my questions. Well, I'm glad I could help with that. Yeah. Frosty FPV says, can you touch on Crossfire on your flight controller, please? Ma, you could do uh, Crossfire on my flight controller. You use UART 4, TX, and RX pads are there. If you want to do smart audio and crossfire, there's two approaches. One is to use a uh, soft serial assigned to the LED strip pin, which there are instructions in the manual. If you don't see those instructions, download version 1.3 of the manual from the Race Day Quads product page. Um, if you want to do smart port and crossfire and LED strip, then it's a little harder. People are telling me that the new version of Crossfire is going to have the ability to use one of its output pins to do smart audio. So in that case, smart audio would get wired to the Crossfire receiver and you would wire the VTX to, the, to that and you would still have the pin on the flight controller free. So, Did I upgrade my antenna on my Tyrannus SE? Asks Reaper X. No, I'm still using the stock antenna. Uh, I'm not convinced that the bigger antennas necessarily improve things that much i don't know i did the upgrade because i kind of wanted to i mostly wanted the detachable antenna the main reason i don't use the bigger antenna though is that the uh you have to take it off when you put it inside your backpack or inside like if you have the beta flight backpack or i have the low pro quad guard you have to take the bigger antennas off but the smaller antenna can stay on and i think you probably do more damage taking it off and putting it on and taking it off and putting it on than anything else so Would a hub 5-volt regulation be better than a VTX for a camera, or could you use both? Asks Jeff's videos. First of all, don't use two regulators at the same time to the same device. So if you have a 5-volt regulator on your video transmitter and a 5-volt regulator on your PDB, only use one of them to power your camera. If you wire them both to the same place, they will fight with each other, and one of them will burn the other one out, or both. So don't do that. Um... Sometimes people clean up video noise by running the camera off the video transmitter and the video transmitter off of like a 9-volt regulator. And they, it's kind of like they call it cascaded regulators. The 9-volt the regulator feeds the video transmitter, which then feeds the 5-volt regulator, which feeds the camera. You get a little more filtering. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that the 5-volt regulator on the video transmitter is oftentimes it's only good for like up to 100, 100 milliamps. So don't try and run like your run cam split off of it. But... It may work sometimes to run the camera off the 5-volt regulator of the video transmitter. My default approach is to use a Unify HV or some other video transmitter like the Mach 2. Or there's, there's tons of them now that can run off a of VBAT and then a camera that can run off a of VBAT like a Runcam Eagle or some, they, they kind of all do it now. And then just run them both off of VBAT. And I so far haven't had noise issues doing that. So that's the approach that works for me. Crossfire uh, FPV asks, I started flying FPV with this ESC and Racer Star 2205 motors. It felt really good. Didn't burn a single ESC. Even after w winning a race, I switched to DYS Storm 2207 2500s. And I don't see a question. Crossfire FPV, I think you didn't finish your question. But cool story, bro. <laughs> Matthew Shattuck asks, I have perfect vision, but my $500 Dom V3s look blurry on the edges of the lenses no matter how close or far I get. Would diopters help even though I have perfect vision? Yes. Try the minus two diopters. Absolutely. Yep. 
Just it's twenty bucks to get the the Fat Shark diopter set. Try the minus two diopters. I've heard of people that that works for. Let's see here. Alex Dalton says on the FT Gremlin mod for D shot, could I solder a wire from the motor force signal to the PPM pad, or would this cause a short? I have heard of people back when D shot first came out, people had to jump through hoops like that to get it working, and the, the that will work as long as you go resource motor for none, so that there's nothing assigned to that pin, and then. You, or you do resource motor four and you move it to the PPM pad. You can then do a little jumper wire over to the motor four pad if you, if you want to. As long as there's nothing else assigned to the motor four pin, you'll be okay. But it won't cause a short or anything like that. Crossfire burned out on ESC. Yeah, uh, thank you, Random, for pointing that out. Random is telling me that Crossfire FPV... Where are you, Crossfire? He said he switched to DYS Storm 2207 motors and burned an ESC. Um, it sounds... I mean, they're Racer Stars. If you have Racer Star ESCs and they light on fire, the reason why is that they're Racer Stars. Racer Star ESCs are great, cheap ESCs. And what I, the, and they have a propensity to light on fire for no reason other than that they're Racer Stars. And I, I, this is not a scientific test. Racer Star, please don't sue me. But I get messages all the time from people saying, why did this ESC light on fire? And more often than not, it's a Racer Star. So my informal opinion is that. And the thing is, here's what I like to say. Let's say that a really top-notch ESC like a Speedix or an Akon ESC, let's say that one in 5,000 lights on fire for no reason at all. And let's say that for the Racer Stars, one in a thousand, it's still a pretty low number, right? It's But it's a lot higher than average. And that's my opinion of the Racer Stars. So many people use Racer Star ESCs and they're fine. But I, I just hear too many stories from people and it's because they're on the Wizard. People buy a Wizard and then the ESC lights on fire and they're like, what did I do wrong? And I'm like, nothing. You just, just don't replace them. Buy Racer Star ESCs. Uh, and when they light on fire, replace them with something better. But um, you were running Racer Star ESCs on 2207, 2500 kV motors. Like, I don't know what exactly happened, but basically what happened is that you, you did that. That's why. Let's see. Um, let's see. Quad I just built. Where's that one? I missed one. Let's see. I just built a quad, asks James Oliver, and I'm running Libre Pilot, but the quad oscillates constantly even at hover. I have no freaking idea because I don't know uh, the first thing about Libre Pilot. But if a quad is oscillating, I suppose I would reduce P gain. But probably if you're oscillating even at a hover, the default pins shouldn't be too far off. I don't know, though. I, I just have no idea what the state of Libre Pilot is in terms of how good its default PIDs are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, unfortunately, I can't help you there. Ryan Zimmerman, thoughts on the new DYS 2207. DYS has a new uh, batch of motors out, a new budget line of motors that people have been asking me about. And what I say about those is the DYS fire motors, um, I don't remember them. I remember them being a little sketchy. Uh, they... Uh, the bearings, I think, would go bad pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, but, um, so I don't have a very good impression of DYS motors at this time, but the, the new DYS budget line, I, what I said is, hey, r people buy Racer Star motors and they're not very good, but people like them. So if the DYS motors are just a little better than the Racer Stars, they could be a good deal. Um, I don't know about the 27, the 2207s though. Rudder side down, any new up and coming goodies? Well, the, the LaForge V4 has come out. Uh, they just announced it shortly before this live stream started. Go check out the UBAD, uh, UBAD page, or maybe it's on the, uh, where is it? It's on the UBAD page? Let me look real quick. Hang on. Da, 
Did they post it on their page? Where do they? I know they posted it. Oh, it's not on their page. There it is. Yeah, it is. It's on their page. So the LaForge V4 has come out. It's brand new hardware. It has a USB port. Yay. And uh, it has in-goggle OSD. In-goggle graphical OSD. So that's pretty hot. Um, Doug Blauvelt, what's the status on my battery test equipment? I've mentioned that several other times in the uh, live stream, so I'm going to pass on that. But I have mentioned it several times. Go ahead and back and watch the DVR. Let's see. Can you mix different brands of ESCs with the same specification? Asks FPV RC Fly. The answer to that is yes. In fact, I saw a test somebody did where they put four different motors and four different props on a quad. And I mean like a two-blade 50-40, a quad blade, a tri-blade six-inch, and, and the quad flew. It flew fine. Probably if you pushed it, you'd notice a difference. You can put... You can mix ESCs, and you probably won't notice much of a difference. But best practice is to use the same one on all, all of the arms. It's the most consistent. Pit Viper Plays asks, Why could I not get my Motor 2 signal pad working with resource reassignment on the RSSI pad? That goes back to something we talked about a little earlier in the live stream, which is that the RSSI pad and the current sensor pad are both hooked up to an analog to digital converter pin on the flight, on the on the processor and they can't be used for general purpose like motor outputs so you can never remap a uh, current sensor or rssi to a motor output or vice versa eric kozak says i did your vbat mod for the wizard but my voltage is all over the place when flying and trips the alarm on my tyrannus that's a tough one I would check the soldering, I think. I would wonder if your soldering was solid. Um, it's normal for the voltage to fluctuate, but the the uh, VBAT monitoring function in the flight controller has some filtering so that every little uppy-downy doesn't cause a low voltage alarm. Let's see what else is going on. Apparently Johnny FPV is in the is Johnny FPV here? CGI. Johnny FPV says CGI. Confirmed. Johnny FPV uses CGI. I met Willie in Atlanta, who is a good, good friend of Johnny's, and uh, he told me that all of Johnny's flights are one hundred percent rendered. It's a new thing that he's working on with Adobe and I think DreamWorks. I can't remember if it was DreamWorks or Industrial Light and Magic, but um, that they're working on that. Uh, it's the same technology. I think it's the same technology that they used to do the speeder, the, the remastered speeder chase on Endor. And anyway, the point is that Johnny doesn't actually fly quads. Uh, it's all CGI. Um, he does fly. That's not true. So, like, remember the video he did in the stadium, the the, the knockdown stadium. He flew a Mavic over the stadium, and it did this like high def three D scan. That they then import. So that's why you can see him flying in real environments. Yeah. So technically he flies quads, but it's a Mavic. He does a 3D 360 scan of the environment using some, then, uh, you know, the, the wizards at ILM or DreamWorks or whoever. Maybe it was, a, it might have been DreamWorks because Sherpu works for, no, Sherpu works for Pixar. It was Pixar because Johnny met Sharpu at Pixar and Sharpu does the animations for him. Yes, that's it. You're welcome, Johnny. That was all bullshit, you guys. That was all bullshit. Just FYI. <laughs> um, what do you find? FPVRC Fly asks about the Horus X10S. The Horus X10S. Hang on. Here, I'll get it. I'll tell you what about the Horus X10S. One of the I did not like the X12 because it was so big and clunky. The X10 is about the same size as a QX7. And I kind of like it. It feels good in my hands. This is it. It feels really good in my hands. I really, it's, it feels wide, kind of like a QX7, which I kind of don't like. But I could probably learn to live with it. Here's what I go back and forth on on the QX7. And it runs OpenTX. And here, I'll turn it on. Oh, why not, right? Has a beautiful, oh, thank you so much. Has a beautiful screen. This is not, I haven't flashed this to OpenTX yet. But it has a beautiful screen. And you know, it's great. Okay, shut up. 
Okay, seriously. It's great, but I can't figure out, like, I beat the crap out of my radio. It's kind of like, you know, you you should buy a beater car so that then when you scratch it up and wreck it, that um, you don't feel bad. Like, I don't know how those guys who have, like, Ferraris and Lamborghinis ever get them out of the garage. Cause, so I kind of feel that way about this. The X10 is so freaking nice. I kind of would feel bad beating the crap out of it. I'm not sure, but it is it is pretty nice. And the other thing is, this comes in. I'll check my I'll check the price. So I'm sure I get it right. The the Horus X10s comes in at four sixty for the X10s, and the X10. I don't know why you would buy the X10 because, oh, that's that's actually pretty. It's a lot cheaper. Wow, I didn't realize it was that much cheaper. Three eighty nine for the X10. That's a lot cheaper, actually. I was gonna say I don't know why you would buy the X10. It's not that much more expensive than the X the, the X10. Not, not that much cheaper than the X10s, but no, it's way cheaper. Three eighty nine for the X10 and four sixty for the X10s. That's pretty freaking expensive. So I just I have a hard time. I don't know. I don't know. Would you spend four hundred and eighty dollars for this radio? It's a nice radio. I'm just not sure I would spend four hundred and eighty dollars for any freaking radio. So, anyway, uh, let's see. Blue Rhino asks in the over at the Patreon for small quads using a whip antenna. Is there any difference using right hand or left hand antenna on the goggles? That is a really good question. So, antennas can be either circular polarized or linear polarized right you got the clover leaves the pagodas those are all circularly polarized antennas and they can be left hand polarized or right hand polarized and an antenna can also be linearly polarized and actually that is not an either or scenario it's actually a spectrum so you can be like 50 percent left hand polarized or 75 percent right hand polarized and there's a a parameter called the axial ratio that actually is a numerical representation of the degree of circular versus linear polarization of the antenna. If you have a, circ a left-hand circular polarized antenna and a right-hand circular polarized antenna, you get about 30 dB or more of, of loss between them, which is a good thing because when the signal bounces and multipaths, it reverses polarization. So essentially that's why circular polarization is so good at rejecting multipath because the, the bounces get canceled, get, they don't get picked up. If you have a linear antenna and a circular antenna, there is a constant roughly 3 dB of loss between them. So it's a small amount of loss and it's not, it's not a negligible amount, but it's not a massive amount either. And it means that it, you, what you can do is you can run a little dipole whip on your racing quad and you can keep your pagoda on your glasses as opposed to getting one of those linear antennas like this guy. This is a linear antenna. Here's another one. This is uh, this is the Menace RC Bandicoot. It's a linear patch. So if you do run linear antennas and you want to try a linear directional patch, you can. Menace RC Bandicoot. Um, but you might not want to put the... I, I'd just be embarrassed to show up with this on my goggles. Like, what are you, a noob? Okay, so <laughs> if you have a linear uh, dipole on your copter and a, a circular on your quad, it's a constant 3 dB of loss, but it doesn't matter. And that's the thing. It doesn't matter if it's left or right-hand polarized. It's all the same. So that's the answer to your question. Yeah, Billy DFPV, that's an interesting question. We had a whoop race day on Sunday at my house. I invited some friends over. And I didn't even record. I'm not, I said, I'm not getting the cameras out. We're just going to have fun, damn it. We ordered pizza, we drank beer, we flew whoops, we had a great time. Um, and I tried using, because the whoops all have linear antennas, well actually no, some of the whoops have circular antennas, but my Acrobee has a linear antenna. And I tried this combo with the dipole and this. And to tell you the truth, I'm not I, not sure, I couldn't tell you. I was actually having tons of video issues from the beginning, so I'm not sure I could draw any conclusions. But I had tons of video issues and I went over to my normal setup which is the Vaz Ion and the True RC X Air 10 dBi patch. I I didn't I don't think I noticed anything worse or better between them. I also tried these guys out at a, a, a five inch race out in a field, and I didn't notice much difference. So I'm not sure. I wonder if there's not that much difference 
on a linear versus a circular antenna until you get to the point where you're getting multipathing and then circular clearly wins. Um, just it clearly wins. So if you're on in an indoor environment with a lot of metal surfaces and multipath reflections, or if you're doing very long distance links where you can get a multipath bounce, uh, then then maybe circular wins. But I think there's certainly some situations where you're not going to see much difference between linear and circular. So I do think though that circular. Remember, circular has the advantage that you can, if you want to get a lot of pilots in the air. Like, let's say you're at a race and everybody's just stomping all over everybody. Or you're at a whoop, you're just at a fun fly and everybody's got their whoop and they're just stomping all over everybody. You can, if they're all using right-hand antennas, you can get a left-hand antenna and you can just be in your own little zone of silence because your antenna won't pick up their signals very much. Well, it'll pick up their bounces, but they'll be weaker. So I'll, it, it's a good idea it, to always keep a, a left-hand antenna in your bag when you go to an event and be ready to swap out the antenna on your quad for a left-handed antenna so you're not picking up everybody else's signal. The other thing you can do is if you have a linear antenna on your quad, it doesn't matter whether your goggles are left or right-hand polarized. So if you're at an event and you've got a linear antenna and everybody else has circular antennas, you could just swap your goggles from right to left you don't have to change anything about your quad. And that gives you a little bit of flexibility. So there's something. Stu! Stu, are you here? Stu, UAV Futures is here? Oh my goodness. It's only 2 p.m. Where are you, Stu? You're in... I thought it was like 5 a.m. there. Where is Stu? Where's Stu? Is he in Australia? Is he in, where is he? Oh my gosh. That's the worst. I'm so sorry. I've just mistaken a Kiwi for an Australian, or vice versa. It's bad. Let's see. Pure FPV asks, so is multipathing with a circular polarized antenna the same as how when you spin a ball and drop it, when it bounces, it switches direction? I don't know about that. I'm not convinced it actually does that. So I'm going to go with no. Or maybe. Why not? Joshua Weaver asks, why not put a left and a right on your goggles and try for the best of both worlds? I tried that once and I looked at the diversity and here's what I expected. If you got a right hand on the quad and a right hand on the goggle, you should never see the left hand have the stronger signal because the left hand signal is always going to be a bounce and a reflection is always weaker than the original signal. But that is not what I saw. I put a left and a right hand polarized antenna on a quad and I flew it around and I looked at what the diversity was doing and sometimes it was on the opposite polarization for reasons which I cannot conceive. So you could try it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up a good patch antenna to go lefty-righty. So, Sean, I know he's from one of those places down under, but I, couldn't, I, I sometimes in my mind get Australia and New Zealand confused um, because they both, you know, they're kind of close together. And they're all sort of down on the other side of the earth. So, and, and I thought it was like 5 a.m. in Australia right now because somebody from Australia told me my stream would be at 5 a.m. And he said it was 2 p.m. So I don't know where that puts him. Anyway, sorry, Stu. Stu, uh, UAV Futures started a Discord. If you're into Discord, he started a Discord. Um, uh, Stu, I have no idea how to plug it for you. I have it somewhere. Hang on. Because you can't post it in the... Uh, you can't post it in the chat. Hold on. I'm going to get it up. That didn't sound right. UAV Futures started a Discord, which is a chat room thing. Here it is. Uh, and it is going gangbusters. Uh, it's so gangbusters that I don't know how anybody keeps up with it. But if what you're into is pretending it's the 90s and you're in an IRC room and you want to go chat, uh, go check this out. What is it even called? UAV Futures World. How do I even find the link to it? Worldwide FPV community. I have no idea. I have no idea where to even find this. I'll post it in the video description, I guess. Discordapp.com. How do you share it? Where's the share icon? Jesus. Help! Anyway. I'll put it down in the video description or whatever. Or he'll leave in a comment. I don't know. Whatever. Oh, it's going gangbusters. Look at all these channels. FPV chat, UAV Futures video, New Pilots Hangout. Just tons of them. Tons of them. Some help help as well. Trying to horn in on my job. It'll 
be okay. Billy D asked, would the new triple diversity antenna setups be worthwhile with a right and a left and a patch? I think you're talking about the triple feed antenna, Billy D. Let me get a picture of that up so everybody can see what we're talking about. The triple feed patch is this thing. It's designed by Martin Bayert. He is the designer of the Pagoda, and he is just a whiz. Apparently, he just sits around all day and designs antennas. But the way it works is if you plug into this connector, it's left-hand polarized. If you plug into this connector, it's right-hand polarized. So you can switch polarization on your goggles without ever having to actually have a second antenna. So that's pretty cool. Reggie, I would like to visit Australia and uh, New Zealand, go see Bruce, go see Final Glide down there, go see Stu. The only problem is that I, I, I really hate traveling. I traveled for my work for the last year, and now that I'm working for myself, I had this dream that I would just stay home and make videos all day. And instead, um, I find myself now I'm going, to, I'm going to quad camp this coming weekend, and uh, various other things keep popping up. So I would, if I could not have to get on a plane for 19 hours to go there, I would be more likely. But it's something I would like to do. Billy D, you say you've seen something out there with three receivers. I mean, maybe it's just three-way diversity. Is that is that what you're talking about? That would be a thing. Let's see if you can find it, Billy D. But I don't know how you're going to get me the link because because you can't post it. Oh, there you go. Se Sean Riley points out that 7C, D, 7, lowercase f, lowercase g, is the code for the Discord channel. Sean Riley posted that. Grab that, you guys who are looking for it. Does a triversity receiver module sound realistic? Asks Drummer Boy Noid. Um, sure. I mean, I've seen uh, Furious FPV had a sample of a five way diversity box they sent me to test. Um, there's the Overlord from uh, Turnigy, I think. It's a Hobby King product. It's the Overlord. It's like a six way diversity. Yeah, that you can have as many diversity as you want. The question is how many antennas actually make sense? Because diversity only helps you if you're using a different kind of antenna to pick up a signal that you would have missed otherwise. So, yeah, you could do tri-diversity, sure. Chris Tuttle asks, Lua Scripts installed latest firmware. Lua VTX page has no telemetry shown, even though PID telemetry is shown correctly. So the fact that the Lua Script is showing the PID telemetry correctly means that your telemetry is working and your Lua Script is working, so that's good. What that probably means is that your smart audio is not working. That's the answer. You're using the Maytech FC Hub VTX. Um, that's not going to be smart audio. That's going to be tramp telemetry. But basically that means that that is not working right is, is what that tells you. All righty. All righty, guys. Guys, we are coming up on 10 o'clock. We're at 10 o'clock right now. I got one more super chat to get from Shai Perednik again. Perednik. Yes, I'm not. I'm kind of pronouncing your name correctly. He asks, any suggestions on a Tyrannus compatible TX for kids? My QX7 is a bit big for my nine-year-old. Thanks for all the knowledge. That's a tough one. Um, I would maybe check out this new one that we were looking at, the X-Lite, um, which looks like a game controller, although it still looks pretty big. The other thing I could encourage you to do is to have your kid treat the radio more like a tray radio with pinching. Kids want to hold it like a game controller and operate it with their thumbs and their little hands aren't big enough. If you put, if you put it on a, a neck strap or there are even some around the shoulder straps that hold it or you can even get a tray and just literally put it on a tray and if they come at it like a tray radio and just pinch, maybe that would help. That's what I would suggest. Should I get a unified 200 milliwatts or an AKK Mach 2? AKK is cheaper and has 800 milliwatts. I would only take the AKK Mach 2 if I knew for a fact it was one of the ones that had the fix to the smart audio bug. That's I wouldn't buy one if it didn't have the fix. Same goes for the Mach 2. The only thing about the Mach 2 is that the Mach 2 has Tyler Brennan from Race Day Quads who has promised he will either fix them or he will send out replacements to everybody who bought one, which is a bold statement. So in that sense, you got nothing to lose if you buy a Mach 2 and you support race day quads. Alrighty, guys. We're going to wrap up. I want to thank you guys all for coming out. 
Thank you guys for asking questions in the chat and giving me the opportunity to answer them. Thank you guys for supporting me and giving me the opportunity uh, to do this full time. I'm going to keep saying that um, every day I wake up and I think, what am I going to do today? And the answer is whatever I want, because what I want to do is make videos for you guys. And, and it's just a great that it's possible for me to, I wanted to do that for a long time. When I had my day job, I would get up in the morning and I go, Ooh, I want to make some videos. Now I have work. And then I'd be super stressed out all day. And now I'm stressed out all day. Cause that's just how I am but I'm stressed out while I'm doing something I really enjoy. And thank you guys so much for that. You make it possible. Um, I'm going to keep doing live streams. I've got quad camp coming up uh, this weekend, and then I'm going to be staying in Atlanta with the Rotor Riot guys, uh, hopefully doing some shooting with them over the week, uh, over the week. So probably will not be a live stream next week uh, because I'm going to be, I'm not going to be home and I don't like to stream from the road. Uh, but um, you know, same videos, uh, keep asking me questions over email, over Facebook Messenger, over over Patreon. If you're one of my patrons on the Slack, I have a patrons only Slack. I'm gonna keep answering them, and uh, you know, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're uh, is gonna do it for the live stream. Uh, happy flying, you guys. <laughs>